Um, and I want to talk about women's rights and women's situation from an intersectional perspective. And what that means is that we have to take a lot of factors into consideration when we talk about women's issues. You know, race, religious, uh, sexual orientation, demographic, sociopolitical, all of these factors are involved when it comes to shaping anyone's experience, especially women in Afghanistan. Now, when we look at these pictures behind me, each and every single woman that belonging to these different ethnic groups will have their own distinct experiences or discrimination in Afghanistan. Because the social and political dynamic in Afghanistan is made in a way that shapes in which how these women are treated in Afghanistan as a whole. Now, the women's situation in Afghanistan cannot be concluded just in the past year. And I genuinely believe that we have to go back a little bit to understand why women are facing the violation or why they, every single, or the basic human rights have been stripped away from them. Why they can't go to school, for example, why they don't have the rights to work. Now, I want to be brutally honest and I want to have a conversation about the history of Afghanistan that may not be so popular. And Afghanistan, and I don't want to whitewash the history as well. Afghanistan, a lot of the Afghan themselves categorize or have this image that Afghanistan is a graveyard of empires. It's something that everyone sort of believes and something that takes a lot of pride. But I also think that Afghanistan is the graveyard of its own people as well because modern-day Afghanistan was built on genocide and it was built on ethnic cleansing and it was built on this whole nation uh, building of Afghanistan was built in a way to drive or homogenize the society and drive a lot of the ethnic groups out of their own native lands which is happening today and has been happening since the modern-day history of the country. So when we want to look at the woman's situation like I showed those pictures Every single woman from those different ethnic groups will have their own distinct experiences. When I made a comment that Afghanistan was built on genocide, I want to look and refer to, for example, the Hazara genocide, which is one of the most, the worst crimes against humanity that they've experienced. And of course, some of you may know with the Stop Hazara genocide campaign that they're still experiencing that. So I want to give a, a quote uh, by Captain John Wood um, in a book that he published in 1872 called A Journey to the Source of River Oxus. This was 1872 and he said that Hazara men and women are equal and he was very impressed with the, how Hazara women were liberated back in 1872. Now another um, American adventurer called Josiah Harlan um, who passed away in 1871, he was known as the Prince of War, very interesting guy. He also um, had a very impressive thought about the Hazaras then, and he said, in his book, he says that Hazara men and women are equal. Hazara men do not make any decision without consulting their wives. Hazara women um, fight side by side with their men. Hazara women go hunting with them and bear in mind this is 1870s in Afghanistan something that of course even we didn't even see in the past 20 years when the unity so-called unity government or uh, in the presence of NATO in Afghanistan and 20 years later a crime against humanity happened in Afghanistan where more than 62 percent of the entire Hazara population were massacred and Hazaras were enslaved Many years after that, Hazar women were sold as sex slaves. Hazar women were forced to marry other ethnic groups. Now, last week there was a program um, that was published by a network called Afghanistan International. I don't know if many of you watched that. But the great granddaughter of Amir Abdurrahman Khan, Amir Abdurrahman Khan is the king of Afghanistan from uh, in the 1890s that massacred the 62% of, of Hazaras in Afghanistan. His granddaughter went on TV and said, which I asked the question about the Hazara genocide, and she said that, he, of course, she denied the Hazara genocide by uh, her grandfather, but she said that her grandfather, she admitted that the forced marriage between the Hazara woman and the Pashtun happened, but she said it was a tool for nation building 
right? But we all know that forced marriage is a weapon of genocide. So, and I want to reflect that as the denial of genocide and what Hazar women, for example, are experiencing in Afghanistan. Because not only do you have this image of Hazara women, the stereotype, the propaganda, the misinformation that's been passed through generations, but also the, the denial of their experience, the denial of their trauma that they've been experiencing in Afghanistan. Now, I don't want to say that the Hazar, it's the only Hazara women that face this, because it's not. All women in Afghanistan are facing human rights violation, and they've continued to face ever since the modern day Afghanistan. But when I gave that quote from Josia Harland and Captain John Wood, I just wanted to reflect of what the Hazara society was like and what it converted to after the genocide. Because you went from a community, a society that was completely liberated, equality, something that we didn't have in the West, to a complete conservatism because they were forced, many of them were forced to change their religion, they were forced to change their values and ideologies into, to meet or to, I guess, the requirements of the, the homogenization of the Afghan society that we now see in Afghanistan. What we saw in the 1890s is exactly what we're seeing today. Because the past 20 years, although women, women across Afghanistan had their own distinct problems, but at the same time, a lot of development in civil society. But now the Taliban are once reversed that. And we saw that in the 1870s. In the past 20 years, again, of course, like I said, the human rights violation, the situation of women in Afghanistan cannot be concluded just due in the past year under the Taliban regime. Women in Afghanistan have continued to face a lot of problems before the Taliban as well. But we had civil society in Afghanistan. Women were able to fight for their rights. Women were able to go and get education. Women were able to go and work. They were within the system of judicial system. But currently, with the complete collapse of civil society, no judiciary system, there are no mechanisms for women to be protected whatsoever. And of course, we all know the schools are still closed for Afghanistan, which means that they're not able to go and get education. I grew up during the first Taliban regime in Afghanistan. As a result, I personally couldn't go to school because I was a girl and therefore I didn't get primary education. And women in Afghanistan are facing exactly that. We also see a lot of forced disappearances among the uh, Afghan women who were active, especially human rights activists. We, for example, Alia Azizi, who was disappeared months ago, and we still don't know where she is. Um, about a week and a half ago, we had uh, the forced disappearance of Zarifa Yakubi from west of Kabul because she went to launch a women's movement and Taliban took her. We still don't know where she is. We also have many other reports of forced disappearance in torture, rape, um, of these women. We have reports where women were found in pieces on the side of a road, right? That is the current situation of women in Afghanistan. But again, I want to go back to the intersectional perspective and looking at women's situation from an intersectional lens. I'm currently doing a project with a professor called Professor Melissa Kiovenda on the um, sexual violence against women in Afghanistan. And we found that women, Hazara women in Afghanistan, Sikh women in Afghanistan, are more prone to sexual violence, harassment on the streets, and so on. Because there's this ideology, or there, there has been this constant systematic campaign against these women, that they are, for example, loose women in Afghanistan, because they follow different sects of Islam, or that, for example, Sikh or another religion. So these women are more prone to discrimination, target attacks, forced disappearance, and so on. And also because a lot of times, for example, if you're a Sikh or if you're a Hazara, if you're a Christian in Afghanistan, there is no, although, like I said, there's no collectively or there's no general mechanism for you to protect it, but these women are more at risk in a sense because they are, they wouldn't have anyone in power within the Taliban regime to come and save them. Because of course, in a society like Afghanistan, if you have connection, you can get a lot done. But you don't see a single Hazara within the um, leadership of Taliban. You don't see any Sikh uh, from anyone from the Sikh community within the leadership of Taliban. So they're more prone to um, torture, imprisonment, and so on, because there's no accountability for them. For example, for anyone to go to say, well, you know, why are you doing this? Or for them to be saved. So Taliban, in a sense, are free to do what they want. 
And I want to go back and touch on, I don't know how much time I have, go back and touch on the fact that how Taliban treated women during the first regime, right? And a lot of, we had this whole campaign that Taliban have changed and these are Taliban 2.0, but of course we now know that Taliban 2.0 means that they're even worse than Taliban 2, uh, 1.0. The, during the first regime, like I said, I was, in, I was in Afghanistan, I was deprived of education because of their regime. But they made football stadiums into a killing um, execution place for women. We have pictures of that, we have reports of that. They, the way that they treated women during the first regime was absolutely horrendous. Complete gender appetite. Women were not allowed to do anything as for example, if it's even worse now because the women of Afghanistan have changed. In the past 20 years, women were able to contribute so much, they were able to get education. So you see a complete change within the society, but Taliban are treating them worse because they know their women are the biggest threat to them in Afghanistan. And so the way that they're treating women is even worse than they did during the first regime. But during the first regime, again, I want to go back to intersectionality, uh, looking at it from an intersectional perspective. They used to have this quote, they used to go, Tajiks to Tajikistan, Uzbeks to Uzbekistan, and Hazaras to Goristan. Goristan means graveyard. Yeah. So, so you can see how they wanted to treat these different groups, these women from these different ethnic groups that I was showing. And I just want to um, have this. These are sorry. These are some of the pictures that from um, 1890s of. You can see Hazaras being in the complete chain. Um, and women were sex slaves, thousands of Hazar women were sold um, as sex slaves um, to the generals or people who supported the Taliban. Um, there's a report in the London Times from 18, uh, 19th of October 1893 where it said that 10,000 Hazaras were sold in the Calcutta Bazaar of India to pay for the uh, suppressing the revolt that the uh, kingdom experienced. But these are the situation of Hazar children trying to get education. And this is the pictures of 54 uh, young Hazaras who were recently attacked at Kaj Education Center. But this is not the first time and it won't be the last time that the Hazara girls will be attacked. We had another case last year in May 2021 in um, uh, Seydou Shahadag Girls School. More than 200 were killed and injured, all girls. We had an attack last year at the um, clinic, maternity clinic, where what mothers who were about to give birth were targeted, little children, in, infants were targeted. So these are the experiences of religious minorities, of Hazara women in Afghanistan. Not only are they at risk, not only are they experiencing Taliban regime, but also genocide, but also targeted attacks. Another example I want to give is the Sikh community. There was 280,000 Sikhs in the 1980s. Today there's 10 left. 10. 10 Sikh from the Sikh community, only 10 left in Afghanistan from 280,000. Jews. We had thousands of Jews in Afghanistan. The last one left in September 2021. So when we want to look at the woman's situation in Afghanistan, we have to take, we have to look at it from an intersectional perspective. Otherwise, if we look, put everything under the same umbrella, we will never be able to, to solve these problems. In the past 20 years, women's rights, women's situation was turned into a market. Who can get the, the most funds? Who can get the biggest money um, to address X, Y, and Z problem? It should not be like that because women from different uh, demographic from different locations in Afghanistan will have their own distinct problems and we have to address it like that. We have to save the Sikh community from ethnic cleansing, we have to sa save um, Hazar women from genocide and we have to address different issues and look at it from a certain perspective so we can have the most effective solutions for these problems. I am not representing Hazar women but so many of these experiences are shared. So Afghanistan has been uh, and is a patriarchal and patriarchal society and in different periods of the history in Afghanistan, women have taken painful steps, subtle changes, but it has been revoked 
by uh, different political regimes and changes in the politics. So the experience of women in Afghanistan has always been affected by the changes in the politics. For example, in Afghanistan, the first time when they celebrated Women's Day, it was in the 1960s. But it was by mostly the left parties and those who were called leftists in Afghanistan. While in the rest of the world in 1909, I think they started with a spontaneous movement of women. In Afghanistan, it has never been spontaneous. The next thing uh, I want to talk about is that the different uh, political regimes have used women to show either that as a sign of modernity or as a sign of being uh, conservative. And it has happened through different period of history. Uh, recently, uh, as an example, you could talk about the PDP, well, the regime of communists. When they came, they started sending women outside of Afghanistan and showing that they are, we are modern uh, society. But reversely, if you see it, then uh, Mujahideen did the opposite. Uh, but. Uh, also, the last 20 years, the government has been employing and did employ some of the women as mostly as a symbol to show that they do support women's rights. But it was, I, I cannot generalize all of them, but mostly it was kind of a symbol. And the focus of the international community on women was there, but it was again seen as a sign of Western rights coming to Afghanistan. The, the first experience I have is under Taliban, as a child. I mean, I was four when they came. And it's hitting us. It, it will never change. I, I feel sometimes. But yes, I forget, forget to say, but this movement of women, I think it's spontaneous. It has been never before in the history of Afghanistan. And this one is, I think, uh, a beginning which is not political, which is not coming with any agenda, and it's women standing actually for themselves. That is uh, where I see my hope. I, and I hear you. But I also hear you as someone who's like uh, almost a sister in the sense that uh, being Iranian and just hearing what you say, and not that I can compare Jomar Islami to uh, Taliban, right? But this idea that, you know, we're, we're still fighting for a basic survival, right? Absolutely. Um, can I ask you a question about intersectionality? I said it in a long time, and in particular the way that Kimberly Crenshaw looked at it. And you said, I agree, it's necessary to focus from a um, multi-perspective of, of oppression, right? But one of the failures of Crenshaw's analysis is that it doesn't actually offer a method towards praxis, right? There's the theory, there's the perspective, and then what do you do after that? Hmm. You are in the UK, and I'm so curious about this because it seems, I mean, you're, incredi you're a long-time advocate, incredibly passionate, and you want people to see um, where Afghan women, the multiplicity of Afghan women, where they're coming from. But outside of Afghanistan, what can you do with this intersectional perspective? Mm. I think um, if you want to look at the failure of the Western presence in Afghanistan, uh, or in the modern day history of Afghanistan, because you've always had one dominant group that led Afghanistan, right? They, they, they were the one who were in charge, they were the one who were in government, they were the one in power. And so when they told the narrative of Afghanistan, it was from that one lens, very narrow lens, whether it was a lot of times propaganda, a lot of time misinformation, a lot of time uh, downplaying uh, the, the values that those communities carry. So if you look at the Hazaras, for example, I said that we enjoyed, Hazaras enjoyed gender equality in the 1870s, something that the West didn't have, for example, at that time. So, and yet, the image or the narrative in which the West have told about the Hazaras is completely opposite. So, 
The first step we can do is to educate ourselves on the political and social dynamic of Afghanistan. Because, like I said, the failure of the Western society, or the Western presence, sorry, in Afghanistan, was they only dealt with the dominant group, completely sidelining the rest of the community. They wouldn't listen to their problems, they wouldn't listen to their solutions, they wouldn't listen to their perspective. Because you can't go into Afghanistan thinking that you can win a war, thinking that you can solve their problems by dealing with one group of people who most of the time have actually caused a lot of the problems. So you have to listen and you have to have a dialogue and you have to ensure that the narrative in which you are pursuing is the correct narrative of Afghanistan itself. So if you, for example, want to help women in Afghanistan, you can't put everything under the same umbrella when you, for example, the Sikh community are com experiencing complete ethnic cleansing. Right? You have to listen to them. Sure, but is this not the way that certain, if you could call American forces a colonial force, is this not part of the textbook of a colonial force? The British, for instance, when they went into India, right? They're the ones who chose Brahmins. They're the ones who decided that they would um, put forward a census and map in a particular way that they would decide certain categorizations of people, mm. right? And it, this is part of the playbook. You can go throughout the history of French colonialism, British colonialism, American colonialism. They choose who are part of their victors, right? Mm -hmm. And who are their victims, and so on and so, so forth. That's, that's the problem, right? In Afghanistan, they went in to promote democracy, right? Democracy is not about the majority. It's about protecting the rights of other vulnerable communities in a country like Afghanistan. So when America went in, wanting to solve Afghanistan's problem, wanting to bring in peace and democracy, they didn't. They went in dealing with only one group of people. And I think, like I said, that is the failure of Western presence in Afghanistan, is that they didn't take into consideration the political and social dynamic of the country. But I, of course, I agree with you on that. <laughs> well, I think you have a lot of hopes that they could take that into consideration, right? Um, I have a lot of things to ask you guys, and one has to do with your particular, the muscle memory that you get from, I mean, both of you were, were living under Taliban 1.0, right? Mm -hmm. And there has to be something said with regards to the resilience that you two have and what you did to get by. Can you speak to that? Yeah, oh, goodness. Uh, I know we heard yeah, a little um, about yours. I am going to go on the, a bit uh, backwards on the things you guys discussed. I think you talked about American colonization. I think what happened in Afghanistan wasn't that they invested themselves on a particular ethnic group. They invested themselves on the warlords in Afghanistan. What happened was that the state in Afghanistan was never powerful. What they did was they invested on the networks of people, which was Akbar Mahawanur, Mahaqir, I don't know, Karzai. They invested themselves on these networks to keep running the state. And what happened in Afghanistan was that these people who were contact and they were warlords, they had influence in several areas, they kept it going for several period of time. And if you see it, in last 20 years, Hamid Karzai was really good to keep this network uh, kind of like calm within himself. And that's why it worked a bit. Ghani was opposite. He wanted to break it, and he did. With what he did with Noor, what he did with others. That's why the state was, I and mean, he couldn't see that my state is not that powerful. He broke them, and then when he came back to them, he, he, they didn't support them. So it wasn't that, I don't see it as it was a particular ethnicity or group that Americans wanted to. They just had their own partners, warlords, that they didn't want to be touched. And Ghani didn't respect that. That's why it failed, because Afghanistan never had a powerful state. The Americans had their partners which were mostly warlords. And warlords, of course, couldn't do much for their own ethnicities. They haven't done it, neither for Hazara nor for Pashtun. There were groups, and of course, that comes with networks of you know, people who can have access to you. So people, in general, 
or deprived, I see it as government and people. Okay. Government never listened to people, regardless of what ethnicity they were. And I do agree that what she says, and to some extent, that's right. There is this notion of, okay, seeing her down, and I have seen it since I have lived in Afghanistan, but how much that plays into this big politics, I don't understand, and I would not go, that's not my area. About the muscle and resilience, I think I talked about it too. When I was a kid, first thing I think what happened was that I had, I had, I was, I was lucky, I had mom and dad who, who uh, had education. This one sentence that always was there was, Taliban are not here forever, you have to study. This was one sentence I heard five years. And I have this thirst to, fit, to sit on a school bench. I thought school was like a dream, like something I, I have to achieve. And, all five years from one homeschool to other homeschool, I kept going and I, I, I would repeat this in my head that they, are, they will go. My mom sent my sister, who was in 10th grade, to Pakistan. She worked hidden me. I am also kind of the, because I was just four years old, I had the short hair, I was a tomboy, I didn't have chaudhary, I could go out, I was playing. Uh, with jeans, life for me was fine, uh, but I kind of saw the, the hate in my mom. I saw how she struggled with Chaudhary, I saw how she... I instantly knew that Tal I hate Taliban. That, that's one thing, which of course is, now I see it differently, but at that time it came to me, and of course the thirst for education, I think, came as a result of that period. I think I would not be a person who would sit here and I, when I came to Norway, I fought for my education from Afghanistan. I was like, no, I have studied journalism. Either you have to prove that this education is not acceptable, take an exam, mm -hmm. or, um, or you have to accept it. And they took an exam. That took me three years. I could have studied another bachelor if I started from Bidrguna. But there was this thirst, uh, this resistance. I think it is backfiring them. <laughs> it kind of did but fire them because but but I, I did had parents people who told and worked with me around and I don't know how much of that is present I think more than uh, like 2000 now in people it, it, that that changes you yeah. the experience Wow, uh, my experience was completely different. Um, we, uh, I, I grew up in a um, central highlands of Afghanistan, Hazara Jat. Uh, our priority was survival because um, I remember Taliban in uh, August 1998. We used to listen to radio. We didn't have uh, we didn't have TV. We used to listen to radio, and uh, in eighth of August 1998, the Taliban went to Mazar Sharif. Reportedly, they killed 20,000 Hazaras that month alone. And so our priority, although everyone was thirsty for education, but our priority was survival. Um, within my family, within the people that in my community I grew up, uh, we, I grew up in, we were thinking about how are we going to survive the Taliban. Um, not necessarily, should, let's go and get education, but are we alive tomorrow? Forced, forced displacement was, was one of the things that Taliban um, did to Hazaras during, as they're doing now during the first regime as well. So the question among our community was like, are we going to be driven out of our homes? Where would we go next? Um, many of our family members uh, migrated to Iran, Pakistan, um, some to the West. We have, you know, across the world. I have relatives across the world. So our my, my muscle memory was remembering how do we survive, remembering, you know, when are we going to be forced out of our homeland. Um, but of course, terrorist of education was also there because when I, came to, when I came to the UK, I was 13 years old, couldn't speak a word of English. Um, but I was so thirsty for that education that literally 10 years after arriving to the UK, I started my PhD. To the audience, does anyone have any questions?
Ja. Thank you very much, both of you, for sharing your experiences as an Afghan woman and as the first period of the Taliban regime. And also you talked about the men of Afghanistan, I was quite upset <laughs> <laughs> because I am also from Afghanistan. And uh, I have uh, actually comment, one comment and one question. The comment is uh, about when you were talking about the change in men. I think there is uh, there's something that uh, we need to mention when we talk about the change within men also because uh, I as a man can be changed in myself and then there is a, a social control. There are many men who are changed. They want liberty for their women of their families but they have a fear of being judged by the society. That's you know, the hard part. Yeah, you know, uh, you have, you are familiar with the word the you yeah. know? I don't but know, without integrity or something like that. And uh, if, if a man have not, um, uh, are not uh, uh, behaving like a traditional Afghan man, then the other yeah. men in the society call Breaking him... Breaking the stereotypes. Yeah, the stereotype, and then call him Bedaira. Yeah. That he has no limitation and he has no uh, integrity. This is the comment. And the other the, the, the question about when we, uh, Dr. Uh, Soraya asked about the American colonization. And you have seen or mentioned that the American war the kind of, they used the warlords. Uh, it's somehow correct but we we don't see the indication because during these two decades of the american presence in afghanistan nobody from these warlords were president even though in all five i think five presidential elections there were many from these warlords were nominated for the present presidential election and you know dr abdullah abdullah war, was in all these elections mm -hmm. But he's he didn't want. He didn't want. He is the world want. And also Muhaqiq and many others that you have mentioned. And now for me, uh, I think it is correct that, uh, uh, that the American and the Western countries, they have kind of chosen their, 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 their one ethnicity mm. to guarantee their political interests. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, for that question, I, I think I have to refer you to the book. Um, if you were present there, the book he has written, he talks about the concept I talked here. And I think there was some element of not letting the warlord also win the election and be the leader. But do remember, uh, you have to read that book and see how much, uh, how it talks about it and how it folds up. But we, I think with warlords and if you see you see like this that if a Pashtun was president, it doesn't mean the Pashtun ethnicity. Oh. Yeah, that's my point. It doesn't mean the Pashtun ethnicity overall had a bit upper hand on other ethnicities. I see it as government and network of these politicians, some people having upper hand on other people. And I don't know if, how much you agree with that. So that's why I don't see it in that way. I see it government and people. And of course, these people, when, if you're not even in power, if you're a warlord, and if you're around the network of government, and if you're uh, empowering the state to stand up, imagine that kind of power, and you have seen it yourself. Who were these warlords before 2001? And how much did change in 20 years? How much their money was? And Nur Muhammad Nur was called the king of Mazar. The money he had, and for each of these people, where the money came from. So it's not about this being the president. It's about how much leverage, how much luxury, how much they gained from it. So I, again, I see it as state and people. Yeah. There were two different 
Yeah, I want to comment on that as well. So, there, for example, I, I live in the UK, that's where I'm from. The foreign policy, the UK foreign policy, is that they deal with Ashton and Afghanistan since Abdul Rahman Khan, because mm -hmm. that's the deal that they made back then, and to this day it's still true. I also want to refer to the US State Department report of 2017 or 2018, one of the years, um, and it's still found in their archive. In there, they have a section that specifically writes that the Hazaras who work within the government are all symbolic with no power. Yeah. And that slavery, modern day slavery, is still present to this day. So it is, whether it's that network, whatever it is, we still have to identify these problems that were still found in the former government of Afghanistan. Yeah, but then I, again, for the Pashtuns, I could say the Pashtuns who were in the government, they had all the power, but they changed nothing for the people. Oh, absolutely. For the normal Pashtuns. Then again, it's people, politicians, the government against people. It, it was not like they were elected from an area and they went and they changed the whole area for their people. It wasn't. They were corrupted politicians mostly. And I, would even for go, and I would go as far as to say they've actually been the worst for the Pashtuns in Afghanistan. Exactly. They've been the worst for Pashtuns in Afghanistan. Exactly. That's why I don't see it like as a problem, one ethnicity above other. It was a problem of people and then of course the politician who represented them but did nothing for the people. Are there any questions? Oh, this is being recorded by the way. So I, um, I'm a Norwegian. I don't really know so much about uh, uh, Afghanistan other than that I'm probably the biggest color designing fan of all times. So I know Afghanistan through that. And following this book, we also have this idea, like, okay, I'll take the kite runner as the example of the uh, two different classes that are deeply connected and uh, the outcomes of their lives are very, very different. And I see that in you two lives too, in a way of you are coming from two different backgrounds, but still the same country. And I'm talking of uh, specifically education. And I'm wondering, uh, connecting to that, if. I mean, I guess you guys are from different parts of Afghanistan, and I'm wondering how are the uh, possibilities of school um, uh, opportunities now in the areas uh, that you are from, and how has it changed from the first time Taliban was over there to now, and, and why is it so that schools for girls, like you said, are open somewhere, but close other places. Uh, why is it like that? And what, what kind of effects does it have on the people and who decides this? Yeah. Oh, if, I, if I talk about the place I am from, then I should have been in Afghanistan married with 10 children already 16 because my father i'm from an area called hugiani that's in negrahar they don't have education they have never had access to education there is not even a road made to that area but i have grown up in kabul so in kabul you need everyone knows the schools are closed from 7 to 10 and but the private schools are open but it's gender segregated about the fact that why in some areas it's open, I think it's the pressure of people. Uh, in those areas, even in the previous uh, time when Taliban were there, such as Mazar and other places, uh, people still had access to education like hidden schools, and kind of they had more access to education than other areas. So it's simply pressure of people, and then do remember even the Taliban in those areas are from that area, and they have their own networks, and that affects also the decisions it, within Taliban. So um, they don't have enough, I think, influence in those areas. And they know if they change those rules, they will uh, maybe uh, they, maybe they will lose the control because then, of course, these Taliban also have their own people in in different places. So it's I think pressure of people, simply.
I, I echo everything that you've said, um, mm -hmm. and I also think the beauty of Afghanistan is depend. It does not matter what background you're from, what part of Afghanistan you're from. The end point for all of us is to fight for a free country where we can all live in a peaceful yeah. society. Yeah, I think it, it, we have to we have to do this together. There's no other way. Absolutely.